So today, 9-11, man, uh, take time to think about that. Uh, for some of us, uh, we can remember exactly where we were at, exactly what we were doing when the first plane hit the towers. I remember I, was, uh, I had just gotten into my office at Altec. I worked at Altec. It was an IT uh, guy there. I don't know. What they, well, I just did computer stuff. And uh, I had just sat down, and my morning routine was to uh, flip on Fox News and look through CNN and see what kind of gossip they had. And I remember my boss was right across the, the way from me, and he said, uh, I said, ah, uh, oh, this little plane just flew into one of the towers. And it did. And the first picture that I saw of it, it looked like just a little bitty plane had flown in. And I was like, huh, what a dummy. <laughs> and uh, and we, got, we got to talking, and I just was watching the news unfold, and then everything else happened. I just remember, you know, my another co-worker came in, hey, have you heard what's happening? And, and you know, I'm sure all of you have a story about where you were at, depending on, you know, if you're 28 years, 29 years old or older, of where you were at and what you were doing. And I even think, you know, growing up, when I was a kid, I remember um, my parents often talking about the day JFK was killed. And they could remember where they're at, what was going on. And, and I remember my mom would talk, you know, we would hit that, you know, time of year in school when we were talking about that. And, and she'd say, yeah, I was doing this and this. And, and I was like, oh. Okay. You know, I mean, I knew it was, it was a bad deal, but it didn't have the impact of what 9-11, the impact that 9-11 has on me. And there's other things in our life, but you know what? They will pass away. Just like there, there's going to be a generation that 9-11 will be to them as JFK is to me. I mean, I know that's important. I don't want to take any, anything away from that but it will pass away. The, the importance, the, the sting of that will pass away. And as I was preparing for my sermon this week and I was thinking about that and I was just, you know, how can you not mention 9-11 on 9-11? And I thought, 200, or 2,022 years later, and we're still talking, and it's still impactful about the death of Christ. What an impact. Just, I mean, imagine what it would have been like to have been there, to have been a part of that. This man that they spent real, only three years really in the spotlight, and his death is still remembered. It still impacts our lives dramatically, his death. And I just think, man, and I, and I, was, no, I was so far removed from that exact day, that, ah, man, that's amazing. That's amazing. He changed the way we count our years. And there's still people that will say that he didn't, that he never existed. There will be people that, that deny they need him. And so today, I'm going to open up with prayer, and then I want to talk a little bit more about that. And so, dear Lord, I just thank you for today and... Um, Lord, today, I just, my desire, my heart is to glorify you. Lord, to speak words that you've put into my heart. Lord, to articulate the things that you've uh, put on my heart this week and to share the scripture that you've given me. I ask God that you'd be with Mike as he preaches in Chicago. I ask you just bless that church, bless the Sweetmans. God, just uh, anoint him as he speaks. And just, Lord, I ask that their church would grow. I ask you to be with us today, Lord, guide us. Guide us through the scriptures, Lord. I ask that more than anything else, God, today we remember the things you have done in our lives, what you did on the cross for us, God, and that uh, what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, today I'm going to read uh, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. I'm going to break it up into two different uh, groups. First is going to be one through three, and then I'll read four through ten, and I'm going to talk about one through three a little bit, and then we'll finish up with four through ten. And um, I'll be reading out of the SV. And so, um, yeah, let's just start. Let's start in there. First, I'm talking about grace. And so I, I thought about this as I walked up, so kind of out of place. 
Um, God's Lavish Grace. If you haven't read this, this is written by Terry Virgo. Um, he uh, founded New Frontiers, uh, where we started off, as our family of churches kind of started off, and then we have different spheres. But this, I've read through this this week. This is kind of what I'm basing the sermon on. But God's Lavish Grace, this is just a great book. And I would just encourage you to read that. And so um, now let's go back to my scripture. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now work, at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom all, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind." So this is a description of all of us before Christ. If, you're, if you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, this is a description of you today. That we are essentially walking in the desires of the flesh. That we are, uh, we are following the spirit that is work and uh, knows of disobedience. Um, this was something that is this, something that I just, I wrestle with. I've, I became a Christian when I was about seven or eight years old. And um, just throughout my life, I've wrestled with how can a person be born? I mean, I would say at age seven, I was a pretty innocent kid. Now, my mom and dad might say something differently, but I would say I hadn't committed any real sins. And so wrapping my head around that, okay, how are we born into sin? How? And, and I get it. I, you know, I always, Adam and Eve sinned, and so we're all, but how are we born into sin? How? And so uh, Mike had said something the other day in one of his preaches that really stuck with me. And it kind of was like the light bulb. I'm not the brightest, but it was like the light bulb that came on. It's like, ah, I get it. I get it. And Mike had said, he goes, you don't have to teach kids to disobey. And I was like, that's, I get it. I get it. I can tell, I have never taught Dalton to pick up that wooden block when he was four years old and chuck it at his brother Dylan. I didn't, I never once thought that. I've never taught him to, to yell back no. Now they might have picked that up because I've told them no several times when they've got into stuff they weren't supposed to. But I didn't t- tell them, I didn't say, okay, Dalton, now I'm telling you, whenever I tell you to go pick up your toys, I want you to yell no at me. And I want you to yell no, and I want you to stomp your foot. And then, if I tell you again, I want you to jump up and down and scream and say no. I didn't, but how many kids, how many of your children know how to do that? Uh, has anybody else in here taught their kids to do that? But we have to train them what to do is right. I have to tell Dalton, no, Dalton, this is the way. I, I get it. Or Dylan, I get it. This is what they're doing at school. This is what you need to show them. You need to show them love. You need to show them forgiveness. I don't want to show them love. I've, I've got, they're being mean, and I, I get it. But, but it, the light bulb came out, we are born into sin. We, our nature is sin. And you know what is, I talk about kids, but as we get older, it actually gets worse because we begin to justify what we do. Because we begin to think about, well, I just showed them one of my digits to my finger. I didn't hit them. I just yelled at them, but I still, I didn't shoot them. I, you know, I cursed, but I I didn't commit a crime. I didn't steal it. I mean, we'll begin to justify what we did. I'm not as bad as somebody else. I'm not as bad, and so I don't need that. I don't need Christ. So we actually begin to fall into a couple of uh, extreme categories, I would say, because there's some that fall in the middle, but one would be I'm not as bad as anybody else. I'm not as bad. I'm a fairly good person. Therefore, I don't need righteousness. Therefore, I am righteous. However you want to look at it, I'm already righteous. I don't need that. Or on the other side of the spectrum is people that recognize there are terrible people, that their hearts are bad, and they say, I can never be saved. 
I've done so many bad things, there, there's just no way that I deserve to be righteous. And that's what they live in. And we've, we tend to fall somewhere, maybe not at those extremes, but we, begin, we can fall on one side or the other until God opens our eyes. If we are born with this, sin is our nature, with worldly passions. If that comes natural to us, we're born as an enemy of God. Now, this is before Christ. When we are born, if we were born with worldly passions, which I think everybody would agree that we have worldly passions, that they come naturally to us, then we are born an enemy of God. Because there can be perfection. God is at perfection. There has to be a price to be paid for that. In the ESV study Bible, it says, we have no inclination before Christ. Remember, I'm talking before Christ. We have no inclination or responsiveness toward God and no ability to please Him. And the sad thing about that, that is before Christ. Christ changed what Christ did on the cross changes all of that. He, what he did on the cross was a free gift, and he changed all of that. However, as Christians, even after we've accepted Christ as our personal Savior, many times we will stay in that mindset that we are unworthy, that we cannot do enough, that we'll look at the times that we fall short instead of reigning in life. We'll... Spend more time thinking about our, our failures and our sins and uh, things that we haven't done than looking at what Christ has done in us and what Christ has done for us. In Ephesians uh, 2, verses 4 through 10, it says, But God, being rich in his mercy, because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, with which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. As I talked about earlier, the first three scriptures describe us before Christ. And this, that was still something I think I have to reflect on. This is where I was before Christ. People that I see in the world that do not know Christ, this is where they're at. I can't have the same expectations of them as what I have of myself, as what I have in Christ. But these scriptures, I think, even become harder for us as Christians. These Christians, these scriptures speak to the things that Christ has done for us and what he has done in our heart. But to accept them becomes so much harder for us because we're not used to something being free. We're always... In, I include myself, we always want to add the but. What Christ did on the cross is a free gift, but I need to change my life. I need to do this, and I need to do this, and I need to do that. And it's actually a lie. What Christ did on the cross is our salvation. There is nothing we can do on the other side of that to get ourselves any further into heaven, or any further out of heaven. We, what he did on the cross is our salvation. Besides completely rejecting him as our Savior is the only way that we won't go to heaven. That's important. That's an important thing to hold on to because we often, even as Christians, we often live our life saying we are not good enough. We haven't read our Bible enough. I haven't prayed long enough. I just can't enter into worship. 
I don't serve the church enough. I don't give enough. The list goes on and on that we can, I just, I, I didn't do this this week. And we live in that condemnation instead of reigning in life, reigning in his love and what he did for us. Nothing is, uh, our mindset in the Western culture is that nothing is free. Um, this week I got a, um, uh, uh, one of those, uh, you know, Boudreaux's, a big uh, advertisement, it's cardboard of Boudreaux's, it says free dinner across it. Free dinner. And uh, so I look at it, like, oh, I'm up for a free dinner. And then, but you start reading the fine print. And it says, you know, at one, it puts a limitation on how much I can buy for dinner. So they're already beginning to limit what I can have for dinner on this free dinner. And then it says that there's going to be a presentation after that, after dinner that you're required to stay for. Okay, now it's really, I mean, we see this stuff all the time, right? And then there's going to be some salesman that's going to convince me that I don't have this timeshare or this condo or this rental investment or whatever it would be that he's going to convince me because he's going to be good at his job. He's going to convince me that I don't have something that I don't need and I'm going to end up buying something that I absolutely didn't need and the dinner is going to end up costing me $2,000 when it was supposed to be free. I mean, that is the way things happen. I mean, even different things that happen to us when your neighbor calls you hey can i just take you to lunch you want me to mow your grass don't you you want me to watch your dog what do you want me to do you know just tell me what you want to do i don't really want to go to dinner with you just tell me what you want to do (laughs) we did we're not wired that way but our salvation is free our salvation in christ is free and really grasping that i think um, is difficult. And I think it's, um, when we grasp it, when we truly grasp that, we live a life of freedom. And I think a lot of us would say, I mean, I can say, yeah, I understand it. My, even if I bring myself to think, yes, salvation is free. It's so hard to stop there. But I need to read my Bible more. But I need to, it just comes so natural to do that. And today, I want to draw us into reigning in life free. And I think in doing that, we have to change the way we think about things. We have to change the way we think about the gospel. We can often live in defeat than reigning in life, in his glory. How often do you find yourself frustrated, disappointed, or condemned because you haven't spent enough time in the word or prayer? How often do you feel like God is distant from you because of the things you've done, because you don't spend enough time in prayer, and therefore you, don't, you feel like he's got bigger things to take care of? There's more important things than me. And I, I struggled with this one. I, um, actually, this is one that uh, even in my prayer time, if I, was, I have always had the mindset, if I'm going to spend 15 minutes in prayer or 30 minutes or five minutes, whatever it is, I'm going to pray for the big things. I'm going to pray for the church. I'm going to pray for the people at, at uh, the gym that I want to try to witness to. I want to, I'm going to pray for uh, my family, the big things. I don't want to spend, waste God's time praying about my individual needs or my individual wants. And I, as I thought about that this week, a couple weeks ago, I was praying and I just really got convicted of that. And I felt like God saying, no, I want to know your wants and needs. And I was like, my God, there's so many more things that are so important. And I didn't, I, I'm not, I just, I know that I have, that this is a, a limited amount of time I'm going to spend and I want to pray about big things. But he actually said, you know what? You're not dying to your pride. You're not allowing me to love you. And, you know, man, that really, that hurt. One thing, man, it, there was a little bit of freedom in that because I need a truck. I need this. I need that. I need actually, there's actually things in my life that I need. But I didn't think they were important enough to really spend time praying, to spend time in. And I felt like God said, no, I want to know what you want. I want to know your needs, and I also want to know what you want so that I can show you how much I love you. And I was like, man, 
That's, that's amazing. That's a free gift. That's free. God wants to show us his love. He wants to show us the things um, that he has for us. What I thought I was doing in humility, I was actually doing in pride by not coming before him as a needy son of him. I think as Christians, we live our lives in defeat, wrestling with expectations that we put on ourselves, the laws and rules we feel we have to live, live by. We should be able to live our lives in victory, in the confidence and in the hope that Jesus has provided for us on the cross. Our salvation and our inheritance into, him, into eternity with him is a free gift, and there is no strings attached. That is something we have to grasp. But we often lived a condemned, defeated, and unworthy life, listening to the lies of the enemy. We are free from the penalties of sin. Things that once held us bondage no longer hold us bondage. That's in the Bible. Christ has broken us free. We are no longer a slave to sin. We are free in the grace and what he did on the cross. And we need to walk in that. Romans 5, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand. We stand in his grace. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. There are many people in this world today that do not have the hope of Christ that we have. They do not have that hope. And sometimes in my life, I can get used to that hope and forget what it's like not to have hope in Christ. I'm convinced that no matter what would happen to me today, God's got it. There might be fears that I walk into. There might be uh, things that I struggle with. But I know in the inside, in my deepest core, God's got this. There might, and probably the, the, the best way I can relate it is when my mom, they, my mom told me she had cancer. And I knew, I, I didn't know what the next six months was going to give us. I, didn't, I had no clue what we were going to walk through, what she was going to go through. I had no clue. But I knew at 20, 21 years old, I knew for a fact it's going to be okay. That didn't mean that there wasn't hurts, there wasn't struggles, there wasn't heartbreak. It didn't mean any of that. But God had it under control, and I knew that. And I walked in that. That is the only way that I can say there's many people in the world today that do not have that hope. They don't have that hope. That's a sad thing. Sometimes we forget that hope, that how great it is, how wonderful that hope is that he, is, he has for us. How do we reign in life? How do we remember? How do we grab a hold of that hope? How do we live our life as successful, reigning in life, and not looking at the things that we don't? accomplished, the things that we don't do. And I think it is, like I said earlier, we change our thinking from what we haven't done to what he has done for us. What we haven't accomplished to what he is going to accomplish through us, despite ourselves. From the guilt of the sins that we have committed to the glory of what he did for us on the cross. All of these, if you listen to the way, I, the way they're worded, it takes the attention from us to him. When my mom got sick, I had no choice but to rely on him. I had no, I did not, I was in unfamiliar territory. My whole family was. We had no other choice but to put our eyes on him. It took all the attention off of us and on him. What are you going to do? What's he going to do to us through this time? 
He's the only one that mattered. It's about him, not us. We tend to think that we haven't done, we tend to think, even as Christians, we tend to think of what we haven't done instead of what he has done for us. We tend to keep our eyes on the things that we don't make it up to the mark, the things that we miss the mark on, the things we have done before we are a Christian. How can God ever forgive us? Or even after we become a Christian and then we've backslidden and walked wayward, and we will tend to look back at that, oh, I can't believe I did that. I did that instead of what God has done for us. He saved us. He redeemed me from that. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He makes us where we are at, and we don't have to accomplish anything to receive His forgiveness, but ask. He's done it all. We were at a conference um, last week, um, Terry and Wendy Virgo, Terry and his wife, Wendy, uh, Terry that wrote the book, was there, and they were doing a uh, question and answers. And uh, I can't remember exactly the question was asked, but it was essentially how Wendy handled um, Terry when they had five kids. Terry was in the, I think it would have been probably the early 90s. Uh, they had five kids in the U.K., and... Um, she had three of them. One, she had to walk to school, and then two that were still at home. How she handled Terry being gone so much and, and the demand, his demands and her spiritual life at the time. And she said, she uh, commented, she said, well, you know, there was three days I went without praying. And right there, I was like, oh, my gosh, only three days? And she said, I felt so guilty. And she goes, I remember, she goes, I had uh, dropped off one of the kids at school and brought back the other two, and they had fallen asleep, and she had some time. She says, I'm going to go to God. And she says, I went hesitantly because I knew I hadn't been in his presence for three days. And she said as she kneeled at her bed, and she uh, just got this picture of a small door to a room that was cracked open, and in it was a bright light. And her immediate thought was, that's God on the other side of that. And I'm going to have to go and, and go all the way down the hallway to get into his presence. And as she talked about it, she said, then she saw the door. As she approached the door and she pushed it open, this bright light just came rushing to her and just overwhelmed her. And she says that Christ was, the words just, I'm so glad you're here, Wendy. I've been waiting on you. And I just, man, when she talked about that, I just thought, man, that just struck me. Is God is waiting on me. He doesn't matter. He doesn't care. He's over. He's forgiven me for my sins. He's accepted me into his eternity, into his life. He's just waiting on me to enter into his presence and to walk in his life to reign in life. We often think of the things we haven't done instead of what he has done for us. We also begin to look at the things that we haven't accomplished as Christians instead of what he is going to accomplish through us. Is there anything that he can't accomplish through us? We often um, will live our lives with our strengths, and our giftings, and our talents. We live it in that, that box. That this, this is what I know. These are my strengths. I was even in a meeting yesterday at Guard Drill, and the guy uh, talking was the uh, Air National Guard command chief, and he says that uh, you don't look at your weaknesses. You look at your strengths, and you build on your strengths. And I would say, for the world, I think that's, that's true, and I think there's some truth to that. But in Christ, he takes our weaknesses and he, were, he makes them our strengths. He takes the things that we can't do and he does them through them. Why? So that he's the one that gets the glory. So that he's the one that shines, 
It's not about us. It's about him. We are his workmanship. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. You know, Jesus is, is not surprised at our failures. Before we meet him and after we meet him, he knows everything about us. He wasn't surprised that Adam and Eve ate the apple. It wasn't like, I mean, it, it, the earth didn't come to a screeching halt. And he was like, what am I going to do now? They ate the apple. I told them not to eat the apple. Why'd they eat the apple? It's a simple instruction. Don't eat the apple. They ate the apple. Now what do we got? Now we got a mess. No, he knew. Same with David and Bathsheba. He knew David was going to commit adultery. He knew Peter was going to deny him. But he still was going to use him. It didn't change. He wasn't shocked by it. He's not shocked by what I screw up. He knows it before. He knew it before he called me to be a child of his. And he loved me anyway. He loved me anyway. In the times that I was far from him, he still, he loved me. And the times I just, I don't want to read my Bible. I don't want to spend time with God. He still loved me. He's still waiting on me. He still has things for me. He doesn't check it off. He doesn't have a checklist and say, well, Schultz did this, out with this. It's not the way he is. It's grace. We need to live our lives reigning in life. We also live in the guilt and the shame, the sins we've committed and what he, instead of what he did on the cross, instead of looking at what he did on the cross. He removed his bondage from us in the, walk, uh, in the law to walk in grace. He was put to death. He provided the ultimate sacrifice for us to live the life that we don't deserve. But what a tragedy to live our lives in defeat, con condemnation, and unworthiness when he paid such a price. This year we... Um, we put in a pool, as I've talked about. This has been a pretty big, dramatic part of this summer for us. And uh, the other day, we've, we've had some people over. The, a couple of weeks ago, we had the youth over. And we, uh, I was sitting on the side uh, just watching. I was uh, watching Ian Flex. I was like, Ian, you're not that big. <laughs> watching... Uh, Oliver do these dives where he flips around sideways and flips and I don't know how he does it. And, and then Dalton and Dylan trying to splash the sides and their massive cannonballs they do. And I just sat there and I thought, this is what it's all about. This is, what, this is why we spent the money on this. This is why we sacrificed part of our summer and tore up the back of our yard. This is what it's about, is to see community to see people in the backyard using this. What a tra I mean, even, even yesterday, it was raining, and I looked out my bedroom window, and the, the pool's covered, and, and everything's empty, and I'm like, this is, this is not what we had it for. It's not supposed to ever rain again. It's supposed to be sunny and 90 every day, so we can use the pool. But that's such a small price that we paid this year to enjoy so much. What a tragedy it would be for nobody to go in the pool. For everybody not to even sit on the new concrete or the patio, not to visit out there, not to even look, look at it. And I think sometimes our Christian lives are like that. We don't walk in the freedom of the price that Christ paid on the cross. And I think sometimes you know, Christ, he says, it's like, no, I want you to reign in life. I want you to walk in life, in freedom, in grace. And instead, we put, we'd pray, we're like, gosh, I screwed up again. Or I did this and I did that. And I, I'm not taking light the things we do, but we need to look past them into what God is doing in us. The price that he paid was, it was so much more than a swimming pool, but how much more the disappointment that we don't live in his grace and his freedom that he has for us. It says Romans 6, 23 says, for, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life 
In Christ Jesus our Lord. I think this, this is a tough thing for me to grasp sometimes, to really walk in the grace that God has for us, to walk reigning in life. If we walk in defeat and condemnation and unworthiness, the world is going to see us as defeated. Why would someone that doesn't know Christ as their Savior want to be a Christian when they have to walk into all these rules all these expectations, all this stuff we have to do. I don't think that's the way God designed it. There's freedom. There's freedom in him. And we need to, we as Christians, we need to walk in that. We need to let go of the things that are, that are holding us back from serving him in love and serving him, being excited to serve him. We need to uh, have victory over the things that held us in bondage when we, were, when we weren't, didn't know him as our Savior. The things we wrestled with in the flesh, he has is, he is broken those. Now the enemy will continue to lie to us. The enemy will continue to tell us that, no, I've still got you. I've still, this is still something that is important in your life. This is still something that you need. This is still something that you just can't serve God 100% because of this. And those are lies. And those, we're not walking in victory. We're not reigning in life if we are paying attention to those. And we've got to fight against that. We've got to, to grab a hold of the scripture and we, the promises that he's given us. And we've, and we've got to live in that. Today, I think we have a few ways that we can respond. Today, maybe you've never heard the gospel. I would encourage you. There'll be uh, prayer teams up here to pray for. I would encourage you to respond. I think there's something about stepping out and responding. Maybe today you're one that's lived your life in conviction, in condemnation, and unworthiness. Maybe your entire Christian life you haven't felt the freedom that Christ is, that we're to walk in. Maybe this is tough for you to understand. Man, it's something I wrestle. And I, I have to come back to this and remember, remind myself, no, this is what it's about. It's about Christ. The band can come. There's, even today as we sit here and we worship Christ, there'll be some that feel like I just can't worship enough because something that they did this week, something that happened will be coming back to your mind, and you'll just think, I just can't do it. I can't enter into worship. Man, I would just encourage you today to enter into worship, to respond to what God is calling you, if he's stirring your heart, and to live a life reigning in freedom and in grace. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you for today, and I just ask God that you would just pour out your spirit. Lord, as we worship you, I pray, God, that your you would be glorified. God, that you would just help us uh, see the grace that you have for us. Help us to enjoy what you did on the cross for us. God, help us today. Help me today. Pour out your spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. And as we worship in song this morning, we do just want to invite you to respond in prayer. Uh, the prayer teams will be on either side here, those front rows. Uh, we also have communion that you are welcome to do at any time as we worship this morning and just as you feel led to do that today. Uh, also, if you feel like the Lord has placed something on your heart that would be for everyone, we want to see about working that in to our worship time so you can bring that up here to the guys and we'll see about doing that. Your 
constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that we thought were dead are breathing in life again. You cause your sun to shine on darkest nights for all that you've done we will pour out our love this will be our anthem song Jesus we love you oh how we love you you are the one of our hearts adore the whole
be my hymn of surrender. This will be my prayer to you. To move beyond just holy intention. And let my life be spent on you. I won't give you just half my life if it's all or nothing let it all be let it all be for Jesus let it all be let it all be for Jesus myself and follow you and as I run for you in your kingdom I'll lose my life but never lose for less of me is more of you No compromise, I won't give you just half my life. If it's all or nothing, let it all be, let it all be for Jesus. Let it all be, let it all be for Jesus. I just want to encourage us this morning just with David talking about not feeling worthy the thing is that Christ is what makes us worthy and I think we do tend to forget that <laughs> and we can feel I know even in my own life I can feel not just unworthy for Christ and what he has for me but unworthy as a mother as a wife you see mistakes that you've made and you go, oh my gosh, I'm just unworthy of this position that I've been put in. But the truth is, is we are not because Christ has made us worthy. And I have to be the mother that God has made me to be. I want to be the wife that God has made me, be, made me to be, knowing that I am worthy through Christ to be those things. And all I can do is look past my mistakes and do what God has for me. And I'm going to make mistakes every single day. <laughs> and I do, but we have to look past that and we have to remember that God has good things. And he has made us. He knows the mistakes I'm going to make. He's not surprised. He's not surprised by the things I have to deal with in my life. And he gives me all that I need to push forward. And all I can do is give it all to him and know that all that I have and all that I can give, all my parenting, all my being a wife and my friendships, all the things in my life are all for him. And he gets the glory from those things. So let's just sing this, no compromise, just remembering that it is all for Jesus. No compromise, I won't give you just half my life. 
If it's all or nothing, let it all be, let it all be for Jesus. No compromise, I won't give you just half my life. If it's all or nothing, let it all be, let it all be for Jesus. Let it all be, let it all be for Jesus. No compromise, I won't give you just half my life. If it's all or nothing, let it all be, let it all be for Jesus. Let it all be, let it all be for Jesus. Yes, Lord, Jesus. forever 
praise, praise you, Lord, to reveal, to reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross, for even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake, you died. Till that stone was moved for good, for the land had conquered death. And the dead was from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. singing that song that has the the line in it I won't give you just half of my life um, I was just kind of struck in that moment and I felt like maybe there were some people here today who have kind of settled for giving God just half of their life like the first half of their life um, that maybe you know the first half of their life or when they were younger they ran the race uh, for Jesus just with so much passion and faith and they were they were doing the stuff and then you know disappointment came or maybe like David was talking about this morning you messed up real bad or maybe you were injured you were hurt by somebody else and I just felt like maybe at that point in the race you kind of gave up and chose to just give God half of your life and maybe you like chose to sit on the sidelines kind of nurse your injuries be a spectator and I just uh, had this verse to go along with that in Galatians 5 it said you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. 
Um, and I just wanted to encourage um, those of you this morning who feel that way, that um, you're kind of out of the race right now. You've kind of settled for just half of your life. That um, that's not from God. That those are just those are lies from the enemy. The enemy wants you to believe that if you've messed up, that you can't get back in the race. That uh, if you've been disappointed, there's no hope for you. Um, you know that if you've been injured, you can't get back up again from that. And um, yeah, God just wants to say that's not from Him. That actually, you know, if you're alive today. No matter how you're feeling, you have a purpose in him, and he wants to call you um, this morning to get back into the race, um, to run the race with perseverance right till the end. glorified Jesus 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 thank you Lord just rest in you Jesus who you are Lord how great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Yes, Lord. Jesus. I feel like I'm always up here. Can you hear me? Is it on? Yes, it's on. Okay. I was told not to apologize for it either, so I'm not going to. I'm just gonna trust the Lord. Um, so just a few moments ago, I felt like the Lord just like waved his love on me and I felt like he just wanted to share his heart towards all of us. And um, he gave me um, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And 
like I was talking to these guys, he's just such a patient God. And I think that the world tries to convince us otherwise, that he's a stern and um, heavy handed God. And his desire is that we all come to him and just, I just vision like um, us sitting in our father's lap, just trusting him and just surrendering to him and knowing that he's good. Yes, thank you, Jesus. We just thank you for the God that you are, Lord. You are patient, you are loving, and you are faithful, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you, you wait on us, Lord. You're just waiting for us to come to you, Lord Jesus. So I pray that we would just be stirred up, Lord, that the passion for you in our hearts would be stirred up and we would pursue you, Jesus. And we pray that we would just... You would just remind us, Lord, that you have made us worthy, Lord. And that no matter what, that we can come to you, Jesus, and that we can give it all to you, Jesus, every part of our lives. Thank you, Lord. Just thank you for who you are, Jesus. Be glorified today, Lord. Amen. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week.